From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Andrew Triforce Howard. Most importantly, you are you. You are here. That makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. My fellow Americans, what do you think of when you hear the word Amish? Barack Obama. Barack Hussein Obama. That was like maybe a third... Barack at the beginning, and then I just started. Who's leaving. cartoon Barack? And I'm here for it. Oh, thank you, Noel. That's Wait, very somebody, ex- somebody, explain this. What does uh, Amish have to do with Barack Obama? Oh, it's just oh. Uh, my fellow Americans is a thing presidents say. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> He's just opening the floor for, 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 for questions and comments. <laughs> you know, I, I'll tell you, there is. Um, this great documentary called The Devil's Backbone yes. that I remember from many years ago with a, an exclusively Aphex Twin soundtrack. It's got mm-hmm. all this stuff from like Selected Ambient Works Volume 2. It's very beautifully Classic used. Order. He's not a guy that licenses out his music for stuff, and it's very well used. It obviously describes the Amish practice of sort of allowing young people to go out into the world and, and uh, live for, I believe, a year. Some of them come running back and some of them, you know, stay and become kind of, stay. yeah, de- de-Amished, I guess. Right? Wait, wait, wait. Aphex Twin is one guy? Yeah, so is Tame Impala, bro. It's crazy. It's crazy. That's nuts. Yeah, Richard D. James is, is Aphex mm. Twin. But um, Wait, how many pilots are in 21 Pilots? Only oh, two. Boy. There's only two pilots. <laughs> but just really quickly, this film is is fascinating because a big thing that happens with a lot of these kids who or go out on this kind of like journey of self-discovery is some of them become, they get absolutely taken in by the corrupt, the corruption of the world and become like drug addicts and there's all kinds of horrible things that happen. And then some of them come back and live a pure, you know, fully Amish life. It's a very interesting phenomenon of the Amish culture that they have this whole kind of trial period called Rumspringa. Wow. I was going to say, guys, I have a very clear picture of a film, also not a documentary, a movie called Kingpin that came out in 96, uh, all about kind of that, like being corrupted by the world. Uh, I think it's Dennis, no, Randy Quaid? Randy Quaid. I think that's right. I think it's Randy Quaid who plays an Amish. I think it's Randy, yeah. Yeah, an Amish, like guy who doesn't know much about the world but he happens to be excellent at bowling and then he gets taken in and he goes yeah gets taken over yeah and that's a country mouse meet city mouse kind of trope yes right? exactly exactly uh but with bowling at the heart of it oh jeez i remember yeah. really liking that movie and thinking like quoting it a lot but i don't know how well it holds up so sorry if you go back and watch it now and <laughs> there's problems but i really liked it Well, you can hang out with us, folks, if ever you find yourself in our grand city of Atlanta, be you Amish or other, which will play into tonight's episode. You can always hang out with your uh, fellow conspiracy realist. We will take you bowling. You will probably win because I don't know about you guys, but I am terrible at that sport. It's very difficult sport. I don't have the chops. I don't have the the form. Uh, if I ever am good at bowling, it's the same way I'm good at darts, which is accidentally good. Uh, <laughs> guys, I spent a lot of time in Ohio. I, I won't, you, you know, it. I won't like take your money on purpose. But sure. I'm sorry, <laughs> is bowling <laughs> big in Ohio? Is this I big? mean, bowling is huge in Ohio. <laughs> okay, okay, <laughs> bowling is huge. Matt's got that shark elbow. I love it. <laughs> Welcome back, fellow conspiracy realist. Uh, as you may or may not know, we have been on and off the road. As a result, uh, we had some microphone shenanigans. Uh, we wanted to let you know you are not crazy. Uh, The audio is a little different at the beginning. Uh, However, we got everything in line. 
with all praise due to our super producer, Andrew Triforce Howard. And now, on with the show. Now, I'm not going to get too into uh, the personal bowling curse, which is a story for another day, but we're we're talking about what we hear, what the word Amish conjures in our minds. Uh, America, as a continent and, or a series of continents and a country is, as we all know, far from perfect. But the idea is pretty fantastic. One of the biggest wins that ever happened in the history of the world was the United States idea of religious tolerance. The U.S. has always, in theory, guaranteed residents the right to worship as they choose so long as they don't mess with other people. Uh, and Christianity, Islam, Judaism, they're all these like people of the book, right? Abrahamic uh, panoplies of interpretation, doctrinal difference. I would argue Christianity is probably the most diverse umbrella group of those three big concepts. And for the past few millennia, since the time of uh, Jesus Christ, guy who is famously known for, you know, bread and fish and being cool. <laughs> you know what? It's true. There's this really great song by this band called King Missile called Jesus is Way Cool. And it's true. Yeah. Not enough people give him credit for that. And I appreciate that, Ben. You're always one to give credit where credit is due. And Jesus was way cool. Jesus was our big Lebowski. I don't know why Kingpin is making me think of he that. He abided. But That's for sure. He did. The dude abides. So, like, for thousands of years, people have been fighting about which interpretation of Christianity is whoosh whoosh correct. In tonight's episode, we are examining a particular group of Christian communities, largely in the United States. They're known for their separation from the larger secular world and surrounding neighborhoods. In the U.S., we usually call these communities just the Amish, but as we'll discover, uh, they are not a monolith, and there is, unfortunately, a positively unholy intergenerational conspiracy afoot in some of these places that don't really meet with the modern world. I guess uh, before we close our cold open, we do have to give you a disclaimer. Tonight's episode contains, at times, graphic descriptions of assault, incest, and violence. As such, it may not be appropriate for all listeners. Here are the facts. All right, what do we mean, though, when we say Amish? Aside from the documentaries, aside from one Weird Al Yankovic song, who are the Amish? Well, in the U.S., the term Amish kind of, as you mentioned, Ben, you do tend, kind of tend to conjure a particular representation of what this might mean. Some of that might be accurate, and some of that might be wildly off the mark. But let's just start with maybe sort of the image that might be popping into one's head. The idea of a particular type of garb, you know, dark suits and uh, broad-brimmed hats, a bit more of a conservative kind of form of dress. The idea of farming, horse-drawn wagons, um, probably thinking a bit of, a, of middle America, you know. Pennsylvania is, is a big uh, uh, area for Amish communities. Today, these communities are often considered to be a bit of a mystery within our kind of more modern American life, and that's by design. They are a people frozen in time, essentially, by their own choice. The Amish live by choice without modern modes of transportation like car, like automobiles or uh, even electricity. If I'm not mistaken, some of these communities may you know, still use outhouses and maybe have like a, a well or a pump, but not like indoor plumbing. Um, and this is all in an attempt to live in a way that is more godly, that in a way that is more close to maybe the simpler times where people weren't as distracted by all kinds of, you know, modern trappings like uh, money and entertainment Supers. and and all the kind of things that can lead to Let's just be honest, guys. It can lead to the erosion of the soul. Yeah. Mm. 
Uh, I would I would say one of the primary things about this group is the concept of removing yourself from anything that will make you less close to God, right? Yes. Less close to being an example of like for the world, essentially, of what Jesus's teachings were or what the mm -hmm. Bible's teachings were. From the bishop to the child, you mm -hmm. live in service of a higher power. And maybe yep. just to, to get it out of the way up front, because we are going to talk about some horrible things that happen within these communities at times. But on paper, I think we, we would all love to be able to remove ourselves from some of this stuff that we've gotten so deeply in, in, invested in and embedded in, you know, from social media to politics to whatever. Yeah, I mean, there are these are things that can just really make you go a little crazy and, and kind of not be your truest, purest self. And, uh, Good side note there, and I love that point, Noel. Uh, there are these things called blue zones. There are only a few throughout the entire globe. And a blue zone is a place where an extraordinary amount of people live past 100 years old. Uh, and one of the formative variables for a blue zone is an intense connection with community. Uh, community is one of the earliest, if not the earliest, human technology. It predates language, right? And it has very real effects for good or for ill. The point about an Amish community or a Mennonite or an Old Order Amish community or a Plain community, as they're called, the point of it is to avoid things that distract one, in theory, from the pursuit of the service of God, a higher power. As such, education is considered only a means to an end. It concludes around what we would call eighth grade in the United States. And your life largely centers on the growth and maintenance of your community, uh, which includes farming and includes participation in religious and social mores. When you hear law enforcement, secular law enforcement, you'll often hear them refer to the Amish as a plain community, P-L-A-I-N. Uh, but the, the, the history is fascinating, too, because the story of what we call Amish in the United States begins before the creation of the United States as an idea itself. Oh, yeah. And you can go the Anabaptist movement, which is part of the basically the Protestant Reformation goes way back. I think 16th century is when some of the concepts begin to arise. And then you get the Mennonites, which then splinter off into a couple different groups, which then become the Amish. The Amish is one of the splits, basically, that occurs. It's interesting, too, because, you know, where I grew up in Augusta, Georgia, there's quite a large Mennonite community, and I always associated them directly with the Amish, and while they have th commonalities, it's not the same. They, they were, like, part of a group that splintered and then became the Amish, and they might share some beliefs and some lifestyle choices, but they are not the same. Am I, is that about the shape of it, the Amish are an offshoot of the Mennonites, and the Mennonites yeah. are still around in their own capacity? Yes. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Going back, uh, as as Matt said, to Anabaptist, uh, the schism between the Protestants and the Catholics, uh, we get a shout-out, reluctantly, a guy named Jacob Amman, A-M-M-A-N-N. -N. Uh, he, uh, <laughs> he is an elder in the Mennonite Anabaptist movement born around like the late 17th century, 1690s. Uh, he said that lying about anything is grounds for excommunication. And the Mennonites at the time uh, had a different vibe on what was meant by excommunication. We'll get into it, but essentially they meant shunning. If your community is your most important thing, then the way you punish people who violate your social mores is to remove them from that community, to remove them from communication, to put a fine point on it, to excommunicate them. Uh, also, wanted, this guy wanted everybody to wear similar clothing, 
uh, wanted them to have similar facial hair and wanted them to not ever mess with the state church, be that in Germany, uh, be that in parts of France, be that in Switzerland. The term Amish, I don't think a lot of us know this, the term Amish was first used in the early 18th century in 1710 as an insult. And Noel, we're going to defer to you as our former... Oh. What do you say, we German boy? Oh, I was once a small German boy. Yes, it's true. Yeah. Um, I and I, I'm no expert. My my German knowledge uh, remains at a kindergarten level, but I did come by it honestly. Uh, the word being Schandenama, um, which is an insult. It's sort of like your ops, you know. But uh, a Shanda, though, it's it's. I, I was just going to mention. Hmm. I, 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 I this is literally an observation. I don't necessarily have too much data to back this up, but the Amish and the Hasidic Jewish community mm. have mm. some things in common in mm. terms of their use of kind of this Yiddish type slang or this sort of German, you know, kind of these Germ German sort of slang, but also in the dress. I mean, the beard and the hats and like the clothing and the simplicity. And I know they're coming, they're coming at it from different places, but it does seem like there's a similar approach to being more godly by simplifying one's life. And by excluding secular communities. Exactly. Very them versus us. Yeah. And uh, we say that as a show, uh, several of us have Jewish heritage. Uh, and and I love that you're bringing this up, Noel, because you can also see similar insular religious pursuits. Sure. Right? Uh, for anybody unfamiliar with Judaism as a whole, there are branches of Judaism um, Orthodox Judaism that would not interact necessarily or not go out of their way to interact with people you might consider reformed, right? Reformed Judaism uh, is is very different. And I'm, I'm only laughing because I remember this great bit Billy Crystal did. Do you guys remember Billy Crystal? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. From earlier? You could forget Billy <laughs> Crystal from earlier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. City Slickers, Stone Cold Classic. Up there right. with Vibes. Curly's Gold. Oh, yes. Thank you for mentioning Vibes, mm -hmm. man. I appreciate that. But yes, Shonda Nama is just a, a, you know, a German word for an insult. So the term Amish initially was a term of abuse, uh, referring to folks who were opponents of, uh, of Amman. Yes, of Jacob. And... These groups, as you describe them, these kind of spinoffs or these franchises of this original schism, they start migrating to what we would call modern-day Pennsylvania in the early 1700s, and they come entirely because of two reasons. Religious tolerance, which was still a freshly baked thing, and affordable offers on land – between 1717 and 1750, about 500 Amish people migrated to North America, and I believe they they first went to Berks County, Pennsylvania, but then they had to relocate due to land disputes and the chaos of something called the French and Indian War, which is a weird name. And by the way, Native Americans and the French do not call it the French and Indian War. No. <laughs> it's the one that kind of stuck, but I've always found it a little perplexing. Um, there are other related groups that immigrated in the 1800s uh, to places like Ohio, Illinois, mm -hmm. and Iowa, as well as more northern regions, including the southern parts of Ontario and Canada. Um, a little later, you would see communities starting to spring forth in Kansas, Maine, Missouri, uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and uh, even um, as far south as North Carolina. Yeah. And still, to the earlier point, these communities are incredibly insular. Interaction with the outside world is highly regulated. Matt Knoll, we were talking about this with Triforce a little bit before we we rolled. Uh, we were we were thinking through our own personal experiences with these communities. Matt, what's the what's the outsider word? What do they call it? Not the Dutch, but they call us. Oh, uh, I believe the term often is English. So if somebody who is more in the mainstream of society 
there's a, a generalized term that's used. Like, let's say you have a neighbor mm -hmm. that has a home and does not live in a Mennonite or Amish lifestyle. Often that person would be referred to as my English neighbor. Ah, yes. Like Gaijin mm -hmm. of Guaylo. Yeah, a lot right. of that terminology does come up in that documentary that I was talking about, The Devil's Backbone. So mm -hmm. it really is a great view because there's parts of it that are completely set within the communities themselves. And then they follow the individuals. They go out, you know, in their kind of uh, adolescent journey into the, the wicked world. And people are people. So just to be clear, I think we can all agree your Amish neighbors are not calling you a jerk. They're not mad at you. No, it's like being a Gentile, right? Yeah, it's, you're just following a yeah. different path, right? Mm -hmm. No one's going to be yeah. rude to you or... They might not let their daughters date your son, though. I mean, you know... No, 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 I want to make just one really quick point here about as we're migrating, we're imagining all of these different groups moving to different parts of sure. the United States. Mm. One of the things that separates a lot of these faiths is that there's not some big central church. There's not a Vatican necessarily sure. in in most instances here. Some, you know, there is a Mennonite church. There is, there is an like a form of Amish church if you really start to break down the different, yeah. you know, um, offshoots. But often when you've got a group of families, let's say moving out to Maine, mm -hmm. you're going to have 20, 40 families that move out together and then that group of human beings becomes like the Mennonite church that's there or the Amish church community that's right. there. Right. And so they, they govern things on their own. Everything is insular, as we're saying here. And Every, decentralized, right? Yes. So there's not, there's not some other big organization that they're writing to or getting phone calls from and all that kind of stuff. It's just... There's no Pope. Yeah. We handle our stuff here. Yes. And the... Um, which means that you're and municipal authority, uh, your mayor, your president, your pope, will be someone called the bishop, and there is a strict hierarchy involved. Women and children, by the way, are at the bottom of that hierarchy. These communities, I love this point, Matt, these communities see such regulation in interaction with the English or the outside secular world that violating the terms of that outside interaction is seen as sinful. It can be seen as uh, a mortal sin. Like if you betray a member of the community to the authorities, even when there is just cause, you are endangering your chance uh, to get into paradise or the, the, the good part of the afterlife. I mean, today, the historic Amish community is itself uh, diverse in interpretation of doctrine, which I think uh, goes to that earlier point about decentralization. Uh, it still holds to many of the precepts that we mentioned earlier, created or discovered or realized by our pal Jacob back in the day. One of the biggest cultural touchstones is the concept of something we call ordnung, which is a codex of unwritten laws of behavior. Uh, there are in these communities, again, decentralized, there are written versions of this behavior. And those written versions are called the ordinal. Uh, they guide all behavior for all members of the community, uh, and this is up to the interpretation of the elders and the bishop. The bishop is the top dog. Again, the mayor, the president, the pope, mm -hmm. the comptroller, that guy is the guy in charge. Yeah, Ordnung is just another German word. I mean, I guess there's the Dutch heritage, and there are some commonalities between Dutch and German, but it is interesting how many German like straight up German words they use to describe some of their concepts. Ordnung mm -hmm. just refers to like order and kind of like finding a routine and sort of like an, an organized way of life, mm -hmm. which the Germans are also quite fond of. Oh, yeah, man. Germany is the one place I almost got arrested for jaywalking at three in the morning, local time. Whoa. Because there are rules. Yeah. Bro, <laughs> there's rules around here. There's rules. Speaking of rules, let's yeah. talk about that thing we were going to mention earlier. My dung. Shunning. 
Shun, yeah, uh, shunning, excommunication, all that stuff. So this internal behavioral mechanism that exists, it is, it varies. Let's say from sect to sect, but one of the very one of the very common things that you'll find in these groups is the practice of going up in front of the church and professing your mm. sins or your crimes, like literal, actual terrible crimes mm -hmm. and you go up in front of the and by the church i just mean the other members of your community right. and you say the stuff out loud then you are not allowed to eat with anybody and the the time here varies but usually it's like six weeks where you can't mm -hmm. go and eat communally with anybody you have to stay away on your own and the the belief or maybe the the order to it is that the rest of the community after those six weeks or however much time has passed, they, everybody forgives you mm -hmm. and is supposed to forget that you ever committed said crime or sin or whatever it is. And everybody just moves on and you rejoin the community. It's in the past. Yeah. Yeah. It's a magic trick. You're absolved. Which could be, an incredible thing. If it was something like, you know, I lied about this mm. thing that occurred and like, oh, dang, nobody likes that you did that. Go away for a while. Come back where we can all live simpatico again. Go in time out. Yeah. But if it's something heinous, mm. like we're going to be talking about today, I don't know how to express how underwhelming that punishment is. Right. Yeah. The idea of my dong or... I'm sorry, my Mandarin's coming out. Uh, M-E-I-D-U-N-G. Uh, the idea of shunning, we can call it, we the English, is in theory a way for the community to self-regulate, to solve internal problems of largely obedience and compliance and keep everybody not just in physical uniform, but in ideological uniform, which is even more disturbing. Uh, we should also note, to the aspect of shunning, uh, it is collective punishment because women and children are largely considered property. Uh, if a dude gets in trouble in many of these communities, then the spouse and the children encounter shunning as well. It's not just people icing you out. Uh, these communities rely on each other uh, for sustenance, right, for continued survival. So these folks who are shunning you are also not helping you build stuff. They're not helping you harvest crops. You're not allowed to help them. I would imagine that's why there is a window of time, right? You, you simply cannot exist in this community if you are shunned for life. Uh, there's no way to live without the village at that point. Yeah, that's a really great point, Ben. The difference between going through a period of shunning and then being excommunicated from your church, which is effectively, like you're saying, from your community, from your family, from everybody you've known for the past X years, perhaps your entire life, right? That's a huge, huge potential punishment that can be enacted on somebody in the community. Yeah. And look, again, it's like any other thing in the United States. Cool in theory, right? Sounds good on paper. Uh, however, increasing evidence shows that this internal regulatory system in particular has been used to maintain order at the cost of people's lives, uh, at the cost of their well-being and their safety. The idea of ordnung, the idea of the ordinal, has been used repeatedly to cover up some serious, deeply disturbing conspiracies. We're talking intergenerational sexual crimes. Again, fellow conspiracy realists, this is a warning. The rest of this show contains graphic depictions of unclean things. We said it at the top. Uh, we want to give you one more chance. The conspiracy is real. It may not be appropriate for all listeners. We will pause for a word from our sponsors. You can turn back now or learn the stuff the Amish don't want you to know. Here's where it gets crazy. 
Not all Amish communities, hashtag not all, but many Amish communities have long records of intense intergenerational sexual abuse. And I would posit that the larger, what we call a mad, the English, the larger surrounding communities knew about this. It had to be an open secret for more than two centuries now. However, as we all know, outside of these communities, more of the abuse came to light to the larger public primarily due to the age of information. Would we agree with that? Absolutely. I, yeah, I, I think that's absolutely true. And in particular, there was, I would say, a helpful movement towards exposing this kind of stuff when we, you know, what, what is referred to as the Me Too movement was in full swing and occurring where people began to be not as fearful to, to speak the truth out in a public setting. As you're saying, it's social media primarily, but also people writing about it in major mm. publications. Mm. These kinds of incidents that would, for a long time, just be kept quiet out of you know fear and other for other reasons. Whether it be fear of retaliation mm -hmm. or fear of not being believed or just mm -hmm. outright shame. You know, right. and to see others describing things that, that we ourselves perhaps have also experienced is incredibly powerful. So, you know, you, this, this applies to the Catholic Church and all of that mm. stuff coming to light in a much larger way than it had in the past. All of the crazy stuff with Hollywood. This is no different. Yeah. Multiple documentaries, multiple interviews, uh, some of which were in print and sat in the back shelf of an editor's to-do list for many years, an, an unholy amount of years. Uh, we're also talking court cases depicting just how profoundly these people, often women, often children, were sexualized, objectified, assaulted, raped, and then forced to, you know, forgive their accuser because they did a little TED talk at the church and then further forced to aid and abet further crimes within the community's larger ongoing system, a very real conspiracy. And with this in mind, there's a thing that we talk about in the world of academia and poetry, which is you find the universal via the specific. So let's dive into a couple of stories. We're going to meet Mary and Sarah. This is not pleasant. These are just very brave people. They knew that they were ending their lives in their community by coming forward. The first one we want to introduce you to is Mary Byler. Yeah, Mary from the age of four uh, or five until she left the community at 17 was repeatedly sexually assaulted by members of her very close-knit Amish community in Wisconsin. This included blood relations, cousins, and uh, her biological brothers even, Johnny, David, and Eli Byler. Her biological father was also uh, guilty of this behavior. Um, it's hard to even talk about. When local law enforcement sent Mary back to her community wearing a wire, Johnny uh, was caught on tape confessing to assaulting her at least 200 separate times as a child. Yep. And this, yeah, this was an elder brother, again, as you said, no biological brother, including cousins, including a biological father. You can learn more about this in a documentary called Sins of the Amish. I believe the court cases went through in 2004. Uh, they were undertaken when she was 19 years old. Well, yeah, and and this is a really rare case where a trial actually went forward. The fact that Mary was given the chance to wear a wire and go in and get a confession is not the norm that mm -hmm. occurs here. The uh, honestly, that she would even get the chance to do that, and we're, I guess we we can talk about it more. But just this thing that occurs in often in these cases where the community itself often rallies around the family member that could be sent away 
to prison mm-hmm. for a long time rather than the person the, the person who was abused the person who was saying hey i need help somebody is hurting me the community sees that but I, I i don't i can't speak for the community but my sense is that the community somehow believes we can take care of that person who was abused somehow or we can shelter that person still in our ways we just can't lose to this other community member who is the actual abuser does and that make dude, sense which are more important than women Mm. that's yeah. part of it wow. that's a huge part of it because uh women are look and i i don't want to ruffle any feathers here saying this but it is clear in the structural social functions here that uh the hierarchy goes bishop and then elders all dudes and then dudes and then women oh yeah and and juvenile males are above women because they have one day the chance to evolve into something past property. Women are taught in these communities, in these abusive communities, that if someone sexually assaults you, it is your fault because you should have done better, uh, which is... <sighs> unclean it's well, unclean there's yes. not there there is no there is no moral parkour that can make that rational yeah no um and you know we talked a little bit about this off air but i just wanted to bring it up here you know when you hear about these types of situations in and among communities or organizations where there is this like wholesale, this really like, you know, big picture attempt to separate oneself from the evils of the world, you know, or whatever, even the evils of, of humans, um, mm. whether it be the Catholic church or, or the Amish community or, or similar uh, allegations of abuse to happen in like the Mormon community, you see this kind of stuff pop up and you have to wonder, like, is it, that attempt to kind of separate oneself that maybe it's almost like poking the bear or something or like give, it doesn't have an outlet. And then there's also just, of course, the, the inherent potential for evil in humans that can just kind of fester in these situations. I just, I don't know. I don't want to draw any false equivalencies, but you see it a lot. And it seems like these situations arise in, in cases where there's this kind of almost prohibition type attitude. And I, I don't know. I, I don't want to overstate the case here, but I was wondering what you guys thought about that. I dig it. Yeah. The call is coming from inside the house. Sure, It's something philosophy wrestles with and continues to. Uh, it reminds me a bit now that we're framing this and contextualizing it, it reminds me a bit of uh, the horrors in Pitcairn Island. You guys know about Pitcairn Island? You have to refresh. Oh, it's a uh, it's a world away. Uh, I, I imagine very few members of the Amish community have visited, but Pitcairn Island is notorious then and now for uh, systematic abuse of children. It's an archipelago out in, I want to say, French Polynesia. It's it's in the middle of the ocean. Like, picture Australia, right? If you're looking at a U.S.-printed world map, picture Australia, and then go way to the right, like off the map middle of nowhere so isolated by its geography already and then i imagine that there's sort of like that you know by design kind of thing to to maintain that isolation and to have sort of like a owned and operated culture and community and yet these things spring up disconnected from all of the evils of like pop culture and whatever television entertainment music all of the trappings of kind of modern life that folks like the Amish are doing everything they can to separate themselves from and yet this stuff just kind of thrives without any of that influence yeah the argument that we're getting close to here would be very familiar to Jacob Amon we're positing the idea of call it opportunism call it original sin call it normalization thereof it's deep it's deep stuff and it's not good (laughs) i know that's an understatement 
of the of the decade. But look, if we go to Mary Byler's case, uh, as as we said earlier, that you point out, this is a very rare thing, right? It is incredibly rare for this to go to the English court, and uh, we see that her brothers were brought to account. All three of them pled guilty. Again, that's Johnny Byler, Eli Byler, David Byler. David Byler got a four-year sentence in federal prison, not because of what he did to his sister Mary, but because uh, he of his conviction for second-degree sexual assault against Mary's even younger sister. Mm. Eli Byler had a prior misdemeanor conviction. And as a result of that prior, he got eight years in prison. Johnny Byler was examined pretty in depth in some of these documentaries. He was given what we could only call a sweetheart deal. It's not the kind of thing that in any other context, it is not the kind of thing that you would expect a court to give a serial rapist. Can we talk about uh, what his quote unquote sentence was? Yeah, somebody who admitted to essentially 200 separate counts of child sexual abuse. It reminds me of that deal that was given to Epstein when he was able to come over to the jail, the prison, whatever it was, spend the night there, and mm-hmm. then in the morning wake up and go to work because, mm-hmm. you know, his work's really important, so sure. he has to be able to go to work. But then he'll come back, and he'll stay the night in the jail, and, sure. and we'll watch him. He got the sleepover <laughs> sentence. Let's not call it a sweetheart deal, a sleepover deal. Yeah. This is even weirder because Johnny Byler is spending nights at the county jail for what? One year? Man. And, you know, I mean, you you hear that and you just have to wonder, why? Like, I just don't understand the slap on the wrist quality of this kind of sentence. And uh, we're going to find out why. There was certainly some support um, within that patriarchal community that maybe led to a little bit of lenience in the court's decision. So we'll, we'll take a quick break here, word from our sponsor, and then come back with more on this uh, disturbing case. And we're back, and we're still in the aftermath of the sentencing and trial of the abusers of Mary Byler that we've been talking about. So as we spoke about before, a lot of the community members will show up in support of the person accused of something. Again, to show support that they need that person in their community. They don't want that person to get a long jail sentence. They want that person back with them. Hmm. So in the case of Johnny Byler, when he is being sentenced, 150 members of his community, and, and I guess the Amish community at large, traveled to the courtroom. On that day, he was going to get sentenced to support him. The guy that's accused of this stuff, the guy that just went through a trial about all this stuff. And uh, it just shows you this thing. It shows you that thing, man. I I learned a lot about this. And I think we all did from Sarah McClure, who wrote a piece in Cosmopolitan back in 2020. Mm. And in that she talks, she talks about a whole bunch of different cases and gives a lot of specifics about them that you cannot unread, but it is very good to read them. I just mean that it's, harrowing to read them and it will not leave your mind for a while but they she talks often about this very thing where even sometimes the initial accuser the person who says hey raises their hand and says hey you've been abusing me right. ends up in the courtroom as a part of the trial or at some point in the trial and says writes a letter or something that says hey please don't send my brother or my dad to jail right and in this case uh Yeah, in this case, a similar thing occurred. I do also, because you guys know I'm a I do also want to point out that those Amish supporters went to that courtroom via Greyhound, which is a uh, internal combustion 
automobile. Uh, well, it depends on which sect they're in because some of some of the more modern yeah, I, Amish yeah, groups. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, I, but but the whole point in that, guys, is is that the community will then convince or coerce someone who is being abused to right. sit there and support the person who's abusing them to out of a what? sense of community. Yeah, they'll they'll show up and they'll say actually. None of that happened. You're making it sound worse than it is. And it's pronounced jazz lighting. Mm. Well, it, it reminds me of some of the correspondence that we've gotten from listeners, um, you know, around sexual abuse and these kinds of horrific experiences. And so often, uh, I believe it was one listener in particular that wrote in and made the point that, you know, kids or younger people or if they're isolated especially they don't know that what's happening is bad like they, they don't, don't know un- it's not normal they don't yes the, certainly but it is possible to, to with that kind of iron-fisted control over information over a community the the lack of outside influence to maintain these types of situations for a really really long time before anybody will dare do what this young woman did in wearing a wire that that is to your point ben very out of the ordinary yeah it's it's something that feels uh with the benefit of being outside of an isolated community it feels like a no-brainer obviously if you saw any child being abused uh, if you saw any person being abused you would feel that it is part of your social contract to assist that person, right? To uh, save them from adversity. Uh, And the issue here is that culturally, it's a very different social contract. If you have ever had the dubious privilege of being on the wrong side of the courtroom, uh, then you will know that letters of support character yeah. uh carry great weight with judges in the various uh legal proceedings pertaining to the decade plus assault of mary byler there were letters that matt is referring to one of these letters was written by mary byler's biological mother uh statistically herself likely a victim of abuse at some point, uh, and her mother wrote a letter not disowning her daughter, but come on, more so saying that her daughter had always made things, quote, sound worse than they actually were, Ugh. and that everybody involved regretted things, had been confessed and forgiven by the community. Imagine your own parent doing that. It would be heartbreaking. I mean, I can't imagine it. just the level of betrayal that that would cause one to feel rightfully so i have to to mention though ben like these letters that you're talking about you know it's obviously up to the judge's discretion to like determine like is this valid like what is the nature of this sentiment you know and it really makes me think of like some people that have gotten in real hot water for writing letters of support to pretty clearly guilty individuals like remember that case with i believe his name was danny masterson he was uh on that 70s show and Scientologist. And, and, yeah, Scientology, but like he was a, a, a rapist. And um, I think Mila Kunis and Ashton Kutcher wrote letters of support mm-hmm. to him for on his behalf that were read in the courtroom. And they got majorly, uh, you know, lampooned and, and uh, you know, borderline canceled for that. So I just, you have to wonder like, where is the court of public opinion in this? Like, where is the judge's discretion in, in saying, I am here to protect this person? And yet I'm giving credence to these letters that seem coerced in and of themselves. I just, I don't get it. It's a sticky point to Matt, to, to Matt's point earlier, you know, are these. (sighs) So intent is always one of the most difficult things to prove, right? That's, that's the reason why there are separate forms of punishment for crimes of passion versus premeditated murder or homicide. So in this, you know, it's it's very difficult to navigate the degree of consent or coercion toward the the writing of these kind of letters, right? Of these sorts of statements against your own child. Uh, and this is something that the judge in the case, in the Johnny Byler case, brought up. And you can see multiple recordings of this. 
and courtroom recordings, the judge, Michael Rosebro says, I see a lot of you, I'm paraphrasing here, but he says, I see so many of you here in support of the accused. And I see people weeping, you know, from the community. How many of you have ever cried for the victim? How many of you have cried for Mary Bylan? And this guy, clearly not Amish, uh, but he is asking a very valid question. Yeah. Yeah. But but also <sighs> seems to give a lot of credence to those letters. That's why I'm confused because right, he that says what he just sentence. said, which seems to mm-hmm. side with the victim. I mean, you know, and the judges aren't supposed to take sides per se, but – that sentence is insulting. Yeah. One, one of the things that Sarah McClure talks about is that often the accuser will be coerced to lessen the charge, essentially, like seeking justice for something that would be considered a misdemeanor versus a felony. Mm, right. And that's often the case mm. uh, where, it, again, the, the abused is coerced by the community to then to say, oh, well, he just, he groped me. He didn't, it, it, we're going to consider it, you know, this rather than full, you know, we'll call it sexual assault rather than rape, right? Right. Or just right. Aggravated molestation, something like that. It's yeah. horrifying. And uh, Sarah, by the way, found 52 official cases of yes, this stuff. Yeah, we're going to, uh, Sarah McClure, an investigative journalist, spent a year reporting on sexual abuse among the Amish. She did uncover 52 cases of abuse, which include sexual assault and incest. And she found this across seven states over the past 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and just to add to that, there, like, here's a quote from somebody named Esther. This person isn't actually named Esther. Their name was changed for this reporting. But this is a quote from somebody in one of the communities that says, we're told that it's not Christ-like to report. Right. Uh, what? She's, this is someone who was abused by her brother and a neighbor boy when she was nine years old. Wait, but Christ and spoke she, truth to power. Christ called people out. That was his whole. Th- I'm well, sorry, I just find this that. is her. This is her quote, yeah. and she also says, "quote It's so ingrained. There are so many people who go to church and just endure, basically endure ongoing abuse." I don't. I don't buy right. that depiction of Christ at all. Remember when he flipped over the money changers tables? Remember when he when he did it. Diss track essentially and curse absolutely tree because it didn't have figs. Well, I can't remember which version of you guys' book that makes it into. And yeah, he endured be you know the crucifixion where you know there's all these biblical scholars or whatever who argue that he could have changed the course of his destiny if he chose, but instead he let it happen basically because it needed to happen. Whatever, like whatever your take is on the spiritual side of the prophecy side of it or whatever, but you cannot say that Jesus was a good little boy who kept his mouth shut. That is not true. Well, the money changers have entered the chat, I imagine. Here's what we know. The Amish community, time and time again, not just in the uh, Byler case, has argued that they already meted out appropriate punishment to these people who have provably done these monstrous acts. Uh, Their argument really internally is that there is a true sin. People make mistakes, they say, but the real sin is reporting it to the outside world because that would endanger the community, the exclusivity, the insular nature, and the long-term sustainability of the grand project. And this is far from the end of the story. There are many, many more cases of sexual abuse, community-based and family-based. There are children uh, born as a result of these violent things. And uh, some of those children are alive today. Uh, We could argue with validity that there is a high likely or a higher than average likelihood of this occurring in any insular community. Predators find opportunity, right? A predator is, I don't know, goes back to a conversation we're having earlier about the, the nature of original sin and evil. We know when outside accountability 
itself becomes the crime, right? then things get very skewed very quickly. Well, and it's also just highly inconvenient for the status quo of a community like that, whether there be <laughs> accurate uh, allegations of, of this kind of abuse or it's just literally maintaining their way of life. To have a criminal case before the eyes of the public out in the secular world that's about the worst possible thing they could imagine in terms of like, you know, the hierarchy and then the, the control over that society. Yeah. We want to, we want to point everybody over to another article that you can check out right now. And it spotlights this exact thing, just how many examples of this exist. Uh, look up what they wore Amish country exhibit spotlights, sex abuse. And this is something that's written in AP News by Peter Smith back in 2022. Mm -hmm. And it describes a, essentially an exhibit that was put on where there are the clothes of the girls, like as young as four, the, the exact clothes or recreations of the clothes that these girls wore when they were sexually abused. And very conservative. You know, we're talking like all the way... <sighs> Yeah, imagine imagine the traditional garb of a Mennonite or an Amish community. Imagine it's, like a House on the Prairie. What's the name of that? Yeah, show? that's right. a that's a good way to think about it for sure. For um, any not Amish in the audience, yeah, yeah, including bonnets, right? Right, and they are strung up on a clothesline with a small piece of paper that just states how old the child was and what they were wearing. Basically, mm. it describes the clothing when they were abused. And it is just a striking way to view um, how prevalent this is. And it is heartbreaking to see some of the tiny clothes that are strung up on that clothesline. I'd like to also add the note from the documentary, which is fairly recent, called uh, Sins of the Amish. Uh, quotation at the very beginning, the odds of an Amish woman getting raped by a guy on the street are almost zero. But from a guy within their own communities, it is one out of every six on a good day. Harrowing. We also know uh, there are more non-sexual crimes that occur uh, between these communities and the outside world. We're talking drug trafficking, weirdly enough, beard shaving. Oh, jeez. Yeah, and murder. Well, it's a big deal. No, it's I, a big I, deal there. I it's know, but as a bearded a man who's been bearded for a very long time, I could mm -hmm. I could personally attest that, that would be a a crime against humanity if someone ever did that to me without my without my consent. No, I, I'm making light because uh, it's the only thing I know how to do when it comes to heavy stuff like this. The drug trafficking stuff is also addressed in that doc that I mentioned, um, mm -hmm. uh, the Devil's Backbone, because some of the kids that do take that sabbatical and go out into the real world there, there's a there's a handful of stories that involve methamphetamines and uh bringing that back into the community and that kind of stuff mm -hmm. yeah I, i'm thinking in particular of uh abner king stolfitz and abner stolfitz not related uh i'm thinking of a new york times article back in 1998 uh when they became the first two members of pennsylvania amish to be arrested for trafficking cocaine and meth. This was in step with the pagan motorcycle gang. We should probably do an episode on outlaw bikers as well. Oh, yeah. The original one percenters, right? And uh, th maybe the biggest takeaway is this. Conspiracy thrives in a lack of transparency. In the Amish community, we witness clear misogyny, and we see with any community practicing this, the same horrifying stories over and over. Women is not quite people, not quite property, not given the same rights. And unfortunately, many of our fellow listeners, folks, some of us in the audience tonight have experienced similar situations in likewise insular communities. Uh, we already shouted out Sarah McClure, investigative journalist who has done so much tremendous work for people here. We also want to recommend the Plain People's podcast launched in 2018, which explores uh, in depth more stories of sexual abuse in Amish and Mennonite communities. For sure. Uh, we were talking for a while about 
you know, how could this happen? Why is this happening? And Sarah McClure, uh, in, in her piece, again, look it up right now, the Amish keep to themselves and they're hiding a horrifying secret. She explains it in a way that I think I understand. And I think we all understand uh, at least a little better. Uh, she says it's not one thing, right? You can't point to one thing. You can't point to a couple things that make these communities ripe for this type of abuse, but it, she calls it a perfect storm of factors. I'm just going to list these off really quickly because I think this you can find these factors sometimes separately in groups, and then when you see them begin to combine, that's where the real trouble begins. She says, uh, one, a patriarchal and isolated lifestyle in which victims have little exposure to police, coaches, or anyone else who might help them. An education system that ends at eighth grade and fails to teach children about their bodies and about sex. A culture of victim blaming and shaming. Little access to the technology that enables communication for broader social awareness of what's going on about your body, about what others are experiencing. And a religion that prioritizes repentance and forgiveness over actual punishment and rehabilitation. So really in this episode, guys, what we've done is outlined all of that stuff. Yep. I think Sarah just puts that into one concise thing where you can just kind of see it and go, oh, wow, okay. If you've got all of those factors going at the same time, this leads to a place where it, it's a – I think it's in that documentary uh, that you mentioned, Ben, in the trailer for it. They call it a paradise for abusers. Yes, they call it a pedophile's paradise. That's exactly it. And there's another – I mean there is a town called Paradise – as well. Uh, and this is this is an interesting point here, Matt, because astute fellow conspiracy realist, we can already note the factors listed by McClure, the factors we explore here are not unique to any single ideology, to any single creed, to any single region of the human experience. And maybe we begin our ending with this. Obviously not every person in any Amish nor Mennonite community is abusing children. Like imagine any longstanding theocratic civilization, the majority of people in those civilizations then as of now and in the future are people just like you. They do not wake up each day excited to hurt themselves or others. But the, the problem is the lack of transparency. That is the original sin. The insular nature of the them versus us mentality, this intense, continual doctor, indoctrination, right? The brainwashing of rules and also loopholes to that rules. That makes the, the ordinal, the ordnung twist. And as we record today, the most heartbreaking part is there is very little indication that the Amish community overall, being decentralized as it is, will take any serious action to address past abuse or to prevent future abuse. Guys, the one thing we we haven't talked about yet in this episode is something particularly horrifying, which is a practice in several communities that was outlined uh, in a couple of places we found online where women, young girls even sometimes, are sent to a type of institution where right. they are to receive treatment to get right with God. And the people who run those institutions mm. often are a part of the church in one way or another, mm, sure. and they will medicate young girls and women with stuff like olanzapine, which is uh, an antipsychotic medication. It's a very heavy duty antipsychotic medication. It's that. Yeah, it's generally a treatment for schizophrenia, right. um, and is only recommended for patients above the age of thirteen, for manic episodes and bipolar disorder and all kinds of stuff. It's very yellow wallpaper, to be it, honest with you. Yeah, that's a great way to describe it. It is people who have ex who have gone through the experience, uh, young women especially report coming back as zombies or their friends coming back as zombies and just existing, basically being told by the church via this organization, you just need to be obedient. You just need to comply. You know, comply. Exactly. And to me, it's just a, another horrifying aspect of a way to control someone or a, an entire group of women. 
I think it's a the horrifying aspect to all of us. You know, this 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 idea dates back to earlier, as you said, Matt, control attempts, right? Lobotomize, medicate, zombify victims, yep. right? Of a system rather than changing the system that produces these victims through active conspiracy. This is this is it. You know, the <sighs> There are more things ahead. We are absolutely not spinning you a tale. These conspiracies are real. Uh, they continue this evening. And for any fellow listeners with experience in these communities, having survived these things, we want to end by saying this. We very much hope you are safe. We are here to learn your stories. Please listen all the way to the end of this episode. And thank you for being here with us, folks. We are going to tell you how to contact us via social media, via telephone, uh, via our direct email address, which we can all see and respond to. We do try to be easy to find online. You can find us at the handle Conspiracy Stuff on X, FKA Twitter. You can uh, get to us that way. You can also find our Facebook group under that handle. It's called Here's Where It Gets Crazy. And it's a great way to share stories with us and have conversations with your fellow conspiracy realists. We're also Conspiracy Stuff on YouTube, where we have tons of video content for you to enjoy. On Instagram and TikTok, also great ways to get in touch. You can find us at the handle Conspiracy Stuff Show. Do you want to call us? and tell us your story or do you want to call us and give us an offshoot topic that has something to do with this or something completely off the wall why not call 1-833-STDWYTK when you call in give yourself a nickname and let us know if we can use your name and message on the air if you've got more to say than can fit in a three minute voicemail why not instead send us a good old fashioned email we are the entities that read every piece of correspondence we receive be well aware yet unafraid. Sometimes the void writes back. Actually, some of you tonight, check your email. There's a message on the way. We hope this finds you in good health and amid grand adventures. We'll be back tomorrow evening. For now, join us out here in the dark. Conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.